Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Jane Friedhoff. I'm currently a creative researcher at the Office for Creative Research downtown in Brooklyn. Um, and there we make experimental data tools primarily to um, help the public have better data literacy and also try to do some social good. But today, actually, I'm here to talk about a project called Membrane, which I made a couple years ago while at the New York Times. Membrane was an experiment in designing bleed and play into digital texts through a concept that I sort of called permeable publishing. Um, before I get into that, I have to do like the obvious caveat. I worked at this at the New York Times. I do not speak for the New York Times or any of its representatives or subsidiaries, blah, 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 blah. I'm mostly here as a nerd who likes publishing and interaction and writing. So I'm only speaking on my own thoughts. Um, regarding this. This is also like, I have to, the conference organizers put our two talks together in like the most perfect way because there's a lot of echoing that's gonna happen here. It's really cool. All right, so what is permeable publishing, right? It basically, it's a term that I use to describe uh, using the affordances of digital text in order to blur the lines between observers, readers, and writers in digital writing. The typical paradigms for reader and writer blur, or even just reader-writer interaction at all, that you tend to see in journalism tend to take you know, one of two forms, right? The first is hosted comment sections. They're usually free text, you can type whatever you want, and they're next to or below the article itself. There's a couple things about free text comments, right? First, they require a lot of moderation. Uh, on the plus side, free text, you get a full range of expression. You can say anything you want. A uh, con of that is you get a full range of expression and you can say anything you want, right? So <laughs> there's a really significant amount of human labor to just weed out bad stuff, offensive stuff, garbage, and that's not even, even taking into account stuff that's just off topic. Second, if the writer wants to interact, you kind of have to wade into this space and reply to people individually, right? It's not really aggregated, they're not really categorized. Again, that's something you can kind of do algorithmically, but it's hit or miss. Um, and if you want to reply, you usually have to reply in the comments section, right? You can update the main text, but it's not really built for that. You know, maybe there's like an editor's note at the bottom that clarifies something, but it's not really in that context. And third, because, you know, most of these comment spaces are where they are, they're shoved well away from the main content, right? The actual article. So it's easy to lose context and try to understand, like, what it was exactly that you were asking about or talking about. So in terms of like permeability, um, I kind of think of this as less of a permeable thing and more of like a huge jackhammered hole in the wall through which anything can pass. Another option you see a lot is off-site discussion, right? So say Reddit or Twitter. So the pros is that moderation is shunted onto someone else, right? If, if, you, if you're talking about it on a different site, you know, like Reddit, then it's Reddit's job to moderate it. If it's Twitter, apparently it's no one's job to moderate it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, folks are also primed now to have a back and forth, right? The AMA has kind of like set that up as an expectation. And people are also primed for conversations that take place to some degree in real time, you know, even if it's not minute to minute, second to second, it's in somewhat real time. But again, you lose the context of the original piece and there's not really aggregation or grouping, right? It's hard to do that kind of aggregation. Again, you could do it algorithmically, but it's kind of tricky because maybe one person's comment has several different types of topics in it, blah, 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 blah. So on the permeability scale, I tend to think about this as a jackhammered hole, but in a room in someone else's house, right? So it's a big hole, but now it's someone else's problem. Uh, and of course, these aren't the only options in digital text, but they're the ones that I saw repeated over and over again in journalism. I mean, there's lots of experiments, obviously, in journalism as well. You see these experiments where people uh, kind of link the newsroom and readers and writers by soliciting ideas for crowdsourced topics or building in features for their AMAs or interviews that have a kind of more interesting flow or different kinds of views so you can see them through many different facets. Um, I actually love BuzzFeed reactions as a kind of very constrained form of communication. Um, but as I looked at these, I started to notice that these methods of author and reader interaction all dealt um, with three different axes in kind of three different ways. The first being time, right? Synchronous or asynchronous. Crowdsourcing uh, an idea and then writing a story about it is not like super real time, right? This is a process that probably happens over months, whereas something like the BuzzFeed reaction is over seconds. Um, there's the gradient of constraints on input, right? Again, free text comments versus pressing a button that corresponds to how you feel. And of course, juxtaposition to the piece in question, right? Like, is it far away? Is it inside the text? Whatever. And uh, I started to wonder what possibilities for permeability lived at the far ends of these axes, right? And as I was looking, again, I'm not a, 
I'll get into this in a second, actually. I'm not a journalist by trading, but I do interaction design and creative coding. And from what I could tell, there wasn't a lot in journalism that was synchronous, constrained, and totally enmeshed with the text, which automatically made it like, oh, let's go explore this. This will be cool. So membrane is an experiment in chipping away at that wall within the text of the piece itself. And basically what you can do is on this platform, you can allow readers to push back through the medium to ask specific contextual and constrained questions of the author. So you get two new basic abilities with membrane, right? Readers can highlight any piece of text within the article, as long or shorter they want, span paragraphs, span a single word, whatever, and select a type of question they want to ask about it, submitting that to the author. Authors can then batch answer questions, and those answers appear inline uh, as clickable inline style expansions. So it looks something like this. You highlight it, you choose a question, it gets submitted. Questions that are answered are put inside the text and you can open them up. These questions and comments are treated as equal in importance to the seed text as well, right? They're not shoved to the side or down below. And they're paths that people can explore themselves, right? I kind of felt very interested in the idea of like wiki holes when you're like, I'm gonna go to sleep after I read about this one thing. And then it's 4 a.m. and you're like, how did I get on chemistry? Um, <laughs> this happens to me all the time. Uh, so it's, there, it's treating that as like a, a valid way of exploring this text. And basically you can continue to follow a trail if you want to. You can ask questions within questions and go down that path together as an audience, as a reader, as a writer, as long as everyone is still on the same path of curiosity. You can also deep link to any particular part of the text and follow the trail from there, if you're only interested in one topic or you want to share one particular topic. And it creates this kind of knowledge tree that can travel. You can travel up and down, it can reference itself, you can explore it from many different directions. I looked for a tree of knowledge and all I got was like <laughs> the Bible stuff, but I promise this tree of knowledge is good. Um, <laughs> Okay, so why permeability? I mentioned that um, I wasn't a journalist by trade. Uh, when I was at the Times, I tended, when I was talking about this project, to talk about it through the lens of what people were interested in terms of journalism, right? So like metrics, you see where people stop, you see where people read to, you know, learning and education, avoiding you know, this problem of moderation and, and labor. But I'm not a journalist, nor do I work at a news organization anymore, so I'd actually like to talk about it through my central practice, which is, Game design. Um, I was a game designer for approximately a million years. Technically, I'm still a game designer, but I haven't made anything recently. Someone yell at me at the mix stuff. Um, in my game design practice, uh, the format often changes a lot, right? So some of my games are weird arcade games. Sometimes it's installation games. I made a 3D text adventure where you control a big hand typing on a keyboard into a different computer. Uh, some of them are games that take place over networks, right? So one of the games that you see up here, this player versus player versus everyone battle, two players play in an arena, it's a fighting game, and the audience who is watching through what's called a Twitch stream can type commands into the chat room to generate weapons and items and you know, different obstacles and things like that for a kind of live game design. Ultimately, the thing I've always been curious about is what play looks like when you blur the line between the players of the game and the creator of the game. In an average game, right, this line is pretty clear. A bunch of developers sit in an office, and they design the game, they ship it to players, and the players play those games within those parameters. You don't like one of those parameters? Too bad, right? Like, you can comment angrily on an internet forum, as many people do, uh, but it's not really a real-time discussion that you're having with the developers. But there's so much more room for play, even within the concept of play itself. So Bernie de Coven is one of my favorite games authors and theorists, and he has a book called The Well-Played Game. And the idea of The Well-Played Game is that it's an approach to playing together that encourages constant renegotiation, reevaluation, and a kind of active redesigning of the game by the community. So this might sound sort of weird, but if you've ever played a game that has house rules, right? You and your friends decide you don't like a particular rule of a game, so you get rid of it, right? That's a house rule, that counts. If you've ever played like an athletic game and then like a little kid runs by and you're like, okay, we're all gonna agree we're not gonna tackle this kid, uh, that also counts as well. So anything can be well played, but in terms of games, it's about this creative give or take experience by everyone involved, right? The players, the referees, the designers, the spectators, everyone is kind of tuned in on what's going on, what the like overall feel is, and working towards playing this game well together. And I really like this because it's a very permeable, organic approach to a game structure rather than that you know, rigid AAA one. Bernie Coven has this quote, um, First, he's talking about co-liberation in the well-played game. I'm gonna to try to read this from the side. 
For some reason, in some way, the we that you are creating and becoming part of is making each of us more fun, smarter, more, more alert, more alive. It's the experience of the me empowering the we, empowering the me, me and the other freeing each other, me and the harmonic creating the music, me and the group mind, the team spirit creating each other. I love this. <laughs> this isn't written, he doesn't write like a typical games theorist, which is a lot of fun. But ultimately what I think the takeaway here is that the benefit of playing together well, of having this sort of organic nature to the structure that we have, is not just that we win a game or redesign a game well or just have fun, this process ends up creating its own kind of like recursive community with each part bleeding into and enhancing the other. Now, of course, I recognize as a game designer, there's a lot of difference between the games context that people like Bernie DeCoven or me work in, right? Which tends to look a lot like this, lots of playing around, everyone's having fun, yay! And writers and reporters are typically faced with something like this, right? The content management, the dreaded content management system, right? But we can think about digital text as being the same kind of living improvisational thing, morphable by prompts and responses by people on every side of the process, right? Viewers, readers, writers, everyone. So working in, in journalism, but still inspired by this approach to play, I started to wonder what interesting parts of this playful bleed can be transposed to digital text? And what affordances does digital text have that allows us to start chipping away at this wall between reader and writer? And so this is where membrane began, right? The well-played text. Thinking about how I could chip away at the barrier between writer, reader, and commenter to make those boundaries a little bit more playful. In membrane, the permeability comes from the readers being able to push through the medium to the authors, providing these little pulses of information about how they want to see a document evolve. The authors being able to respond in real time, in context, creating a document whose branches spiral out into this tree of knowledge. And the document is ultimately shaped by time, the people, the curiosity, and so on and so forth of the community. Okay, so let's talk about how it actually works <laughs> and how its structure influences the way that people can move through it. So first, an author writes their initial piece. I'll call that the seed piece. Um, it can be as long as they want, short as they want. You can put basically anything you want in it. You want to make a sonnet as a seed piece, go ahead. You can then, as an author, list a set of prompts that you're interested in receiving, right? So if you're a journalist, maybe that looks like the classic who, what, where, when, why, right? You're talking about something factual, maybe you're talking about an event or a political thing or whatever, and you expect or anticipate that people will want to know these questions about it. But it actually works for any kind of prompt, right? So you can put in your own prompts, they could be specialty prompts. So like, for example, if you are writing something about cooking, maybe you anticipate that people will have questions about the techniques, the substitutions, or the conversions. Or, oh, it did something weird to my emoji. Well, my thing works with emoji, even though, even though Google, Google Slides doesn't really seem to, but it works with emoji too, so you can have your prompts even be emoji if you're more interested in kind of reactions. Basically, you can define what kinds of questions or prompts you're interested in hearing. So let's say someone uses the classic journalism prompts just for ease of reference. That means when a user highlights any piece of text on that page, anywhere, any length, they get to choose one of those questions to submit about it. When a user submits a prompt, the prompt basically keeps track of a couple core things. It keeps track of the thing that it was asked on, right? So it knows its parent. It gives itself its own ID. It keeps track of what question or response it is, right? Is it a how? Is it a conversion? Is it a substitution? Is it a why? It keeps track of the part of the text the person is asking about or responding to, and it keeps track of the ID of the user who submitted it. Then the author can look at all the questions or prompts they've gotten on a particular piece of writing, right? The author gets a list of all those responses and can choose which ones they want to answer. And two critical things that you get to do here, uh, let's say someone asks a question that you feel you've already answered, you can choose to reuse an old answer, and if many people ask basically the same question, right, if you have an audience of more than like three people, if many people ask the same question at the same time, you can choose to batch answer, which sends notifications to everyone. And this response basically keeps track of a few things, right? Keeps track of what its own ID is. It keeps track of the questions that it's answering, and its questions, which will be important in a second. It keeps track of its own text, right? The text is relevant. It keeps track of the author who wrote it, and it gives itself a unique slug, which is what allows you to deep link to one particular response. The answer text gets highlighted, and you can click to reveal the answer in line. You're gonna ask and answer questions with it, not answer too. And so this is basically what the tree looks like after a set of questions and responses. Each thing only keeps track of its parent, making it a kind of tree structure. So the prompt knows its parent text, and the text knows whether it has any parent questions. 
And what's cool about this structure, at least to me, like I'm a little bit of a nerd about these things, is that it means you can transpose entire branches into new contexts. So let's say I have this piece on the left about membrane, and now I have a whole other article that mentions membrane, right? Let's say I write a talk, uh, write up of this, this talk in this event. And let's say someone in that second piece asks, what about membrane, right? And someone's already asked that, and I've answered that over here. In the admin interface, I could say, hey, this has already been answered, and add it to that list of parents that the response has. And not only will it add that response as an inline answer, it'll carry over the rest of the branch as well. So in effect, it really kind of looks more like this, and you'll notice the line between those two texts is now gone. So you can map this and start to see what concepts and questions show up the most. It centralizes information in a way that makes it a lot easier to update, because you're only updating one thing. And it really lets you take this winding route through related information, kind of like a wiki hole. And of course, you can add on to this branch. You can go back to one of these other texts and add on there too. You can continue whatever lines of thought you're interested in. Uh, you can refer to higher up branches, so you can like loop back up to the top of the text. Sometimes you'll have a text within a text, and it gets like really like bwomp inception. Uh, but it creates this really incredible tree uh, that you can traverse basically in any way that you want. Okay, so let's do a quick demo. I'm going to turn on mirroring displays. I have some reference text written up just so I can like have, not have to think about what it is I'm typing. Cool, so also like, don't, don't take pictures of this. This was unfinished, <laughs> so it's gonna, okay. So it's gonna look a little funny. Don't mind the CSS basically. So I'm gonna write my first piece of text. Finish. Here it is. As a reader, I can go over here and let's say that I'm curious about what permeable publishing is. So I'll say, what's that? Let's say that I have like a twin. My twin will have a goatee. My twin also wants to know what this is, right? She selects something slightly different than me. She says, what? So we have two questions now. As the author, I can go and I can see what questions exist on this article. So I'm going to say, answer this question. I'm going to give a new answer. I have a pre-written answer. I'm going to paste it in here. And actually, it turns out this answers a couple other questions. So I don't want to go and like put in every single time this has been answered. So I'm just going to click, yep, it answers this. I'm going to hit finish. It's going to load Bootstrap. It's going to establish a secure connection. <laughs> All right, cool. So we can see that there's no unanswered questions now. If I go back here, you can see this is highlighted in line and it shows this in line here as well. Um, let's say I want to ask a question. Uh, I'll say, blur in the lines oh, between observers and readers and writers. And I'll say, why? Who wants to do that? So I'll go back to my little admin panel. I'll go here. Oops, sorry. I'll see questions asked about this. I'll answer this question. I'll give a new answer. And I'm going to say, effectively, because it's cool. So I'm going to hit continue. <laughs> and finish. Um, now that's answered. I'm going to go back to the original one. I'm going to hit this. And there it is. And we can really dive deep. And actually, if I, just because I'm going to troll myself, I can ask a question like this. It's not really a question. Um, but let's like, let's like get into like Borges land. Uh, I think I have enough time for this. I'm going to say this is already answered. And I'm going to say it was answered by this first question. So, because it's so flexible, I can enter this loop where now I'm within the tree, within the tree, within the tree. Uh, endless possibilities, endless possibilities. So, uh, so I'll go quick because I know I don't have a lot of time left. Uh, where did it go? Where's my presentation? Where's the actual thing? Uh, hmm. All right, so I'll just talk to you then. <laughs> so um, uh, you might be wondering, oh my god, is this open source? Can I use it? Can I mess around with it? Unfortunately, um, I left my job before the project launched. It was not picked up, and it eventually died closed source. This makes me very sad, uh, trust me. But I think it still stands as a way to think about how we can use simple affordances of digital text, right? This is like literally just highlighting and accordions, right? This is not like super complex. I'm not using like AR, VR, Google Cardboard, right? Um, although I think those things are awesome, like this is very low load. Uh, and they let us start to poke holes between the walls that we usually put up between reader and writer. 
And I think regardless of the formats and tech that we use to make this bleed, I think that creating these playful spaces in our text in the first place helps us create that we that becomes the me that becomes the we that this ad hoc blurry community can, as Bernie de Coven might say, make each of us more fun, smarter, more alert, and more alive. Thank you.